Hello again, today we will be talking about Spirited Away. Sento Shiru no Kamika Kuchi, or Spirited Away, is a Japanese animated fantasy film written and directed by Miyazaki and animated by Studio Ghibli. There is a bit, a bit of a debate going on about if it's pronounced Ghibli or Ghibli, and I think I can answer some of your questions. So, in order to name the studio, Miyazaki took inspiration from um, an Italian brain and it's called Ghibli, which comes from the Arabian word, also pronounced Ghibli. So, if you want to go by the original pronunciation, it will be Ghibli Studios. However, the Japanese people and Miyazaki himself do not pronounce it that way. They pronounce it Ghibli. It's not Ghibli, it's Ghibli because they do not have the L sound. So, the way that I see things, you can pronounce it either Ghibli or Ghibli. I will be calling it Ghibli because my mother language, which is Portuguese, is closer to Italian so I'm more used to the word Ghibli. So originally released in Japan on 2002-2001 by distributor Toho, the film received universal acclaim both overseas and in Japan and it became the, the highest grossing film in Japanese history until the recent year of 2020 when it was surpassed by the Demon Slayer movie, or Kimetsu no Yaiba movie. It won an Oscar and a Golden Bear. The reputation of Spirited Away as one of the greatest movies of all time is well deserved and if you didn't see, if you haven't seen the movie yet, I really do recommend it. Ghibli movies as a whole were one of my first contacts with the Japanese animated media I thought back in the day I didn't know what anime was, nor did I even have access to the internet. I was in primary school, around 8 years old, and when I was at that age, all the movies that I watched, and all the shows that I watched, and all the books that I read, all of that were given to me by my parents. So, during that time I watched a lot of Ghibli movies, I watched Spirited Away, Oz Moving Castle, um, Nausicaa, Princess Mononoke, Ponyo, I think it was around that time as well, The Cat Returns, and even Grave of the Fireflies. And it was the first time that a movie made me cry, but that is another a story for another day. Between all the Ghibli movies that I watched, there were two that became my favorite at that time, and those were Spirited Away and Owl's Movie Castle. First, let's talk about the name of the movie, Sento Shihiro no Kamikakuchi. The name Shihiro means a thousand questions, alluding to the curious natures, nature of our protagonist. And the name Sen means just 1000. Kamikakuchi means Spirited Away. In the past, when someone would disappear mysteriously, which happened with a great frequency, the common folk would say that person had been hidden by the kami, this is, hidden by the spirits. This phenomenon was known as, spirit, as kamikakuchi, or spirited away. Sometimes the person will return, sometimes not, and when they return, sometimes they had no recollection of being gone, other times they would other times they would have stories to tell about their time in the spirit world. Spirit of the Way is a coming of age story who follows the journey of Chiyo, a ten year old girl who, while moving to a new neighborhood, accidentally enters the spirit realm with her parents, who get turned into pigs due to their behavior. In order to save them, Chiyo has to work on a bad house, which is run by the witch Yubaba.
When the movie opens, it seems the story will be set during the modern era. The, remember that the movie was released in 2001, so that is what I'm referring to as modern era. But once Shiro and her parents cross a tunnel, which serves as the patches to the spirit realm, and set foot on an abandoned theme park, we are quickly transported in time to the Meiji era, or better said, to a spirit world inspired by the Meiji era. Since we have this duality, it is important that I give you context on both periods, the modern era and the Meiji era. The, the economy of Japan has reached a peak in the 1980s, but the excessive loaning from banks led to the crash, the crash of the stock market in the 1990s. This time of great economic distress was known, is known as the lost decade. This collapse is actually mentioned in the movie by Shiro's father when he comments about the theme park. Because when the economy was bustling, theme parks such as the one we see in the movie were, bu were being built everywhere because laser-related projects were readily invested into. And then all of those theme parks were abandoned when the crash occurred. To answer the question why the Meiji era we have to talk a little bit about the era that comes before it, the Edo era. During this period, the Japanese society was almost completely isolated from the rest of the world by order of the Tokugawa shogunate. When the shogunate began to weaken, the US and the other Western forces demanded the opening of Japan, which started the Meiji era. Wanting to compete with the Western market, the government of Japan promoted a mass westernization and this new influence led to the growth to, of consumerism, greed and the devaluing of, the, of traditional Japanese culture, themes that are very present in spirited away as we will see. On an interview he made for Animaji in May 2001, Miyazaki revealed that the Edo Tokyo Open Air Architectural Museum was one of the sources of inspiration for the buildings we see in the scenarios of Spirited Away. This museum is located in Kogane Park, Tokyo, and it enables visitors to enter and explore a wide variety of buildings of different styles and periods, including buildings of the Meiji period. The Notoya Ryokan, a traditional Japanese inn located in Yamagata Prefecture, the Hotel Meguro Gajouen in Tokyo, and the Dogo Onsen, a hot spring found in the city of Matsuyama, are also said to be places that influenced Miyazaki during the creation of the movie. But take this information with a grain of salt, because I couldn't find the, its origin. Some people also draw a parallel between the town of Jiufei in Taiwan and the abandoned theme park from the beginning of the movie, but Miyazaki himself denied that there is a relation. Lots of words can be used to describe the music in the movie, but my personal pick are the words beautiful, melancholic and soothing. This impressive score was composed and conducted by Joey Ichaiji and performed by the New Japan Philharmonic. The soundtrack received several awards. As for the closing song, Always With Me, it was written and performed by Yomi Kimura, a composer and lead player from Osaka, and it also received an award. The lyrics were written by Kimura's friend Wakaku Kakum. The song was actually intended to be used for a Miyazaki film which was never released, which will be called Rin, the Chimney Painter. Curiously, this, this movie would also be set at the Bat House, because Miyazaki had been wanting to write a story set on an onsen for quite a while, but all of the proposals previous to Spirited Away were rejected. It's interesting to see that the song Always With Me matches Spirited Away really well, considering that it was made for the abandoned project of Miyazaki, 
which probably leads me to believe that Rin the Chimney Painter would touch on some of the sub some of the subjects which are also present in Spirited Away. For the ones who didn't watch the movie yet, this is your last warning to walk away. It will be spoiler territory from now onwards. The movie starts by showing us a close-up of a bucket of flowers with a farewell card written to Shihiro by, we, by who we can presume is a friend. Then Shihiro's dad calls, calls her twice and the bucket moves away letting us see her feet as if they are our own feet. This shot is telling us that we will be seeing the movie through the eyes of Shihiro. As for not reacting right away to her father's call, Miyazaki said this on an interview in the animation festival Novels Images do Japan, December 2001. It's because there are many young girls in Japan right now who are like that. They are more and more insensitive to the efforts that their parents are making to keep them happy. There is a scene in which Shihiro doesn't react when her father calls her name. It's only after the second time he calls her that she replies. Many of my staff told me to make it three times instead of two, because that's how many girls are like these days. They don't immediately react to the call of the parents. So, to create Shihiro, voiced in Japanese by Rumi Iwaji and in English by David Shade, Miyazaki drew inspiration from real 10-year-old girls, friends of his family, with whom he would spend time with during summer vacation. On the aforementioned interview, Miyazaki stated, It was through observing the daughter of a friend that I realized there were no films that directly spoke to her. Certainly, girls like her see films that contain characters their age, but they can't identify with them because they are imaginary characters that don't resemble them at all. Every time I wrote or drew something concerning the character of Shihiro and her actions, I asked myself the question whether my friend's daughter or her friends would be capable of doing it. That was my criteria for every scene in which I gave Shihiro another task or challenge because it's through surmounting these challenges that this little Japanese girl becomes a capable person. This shows Miyazaki created Shihiro with great care. Children on show have the tendency to be either annoying brats or angelic beings whose sole purpose is to appear cute before the camera, which in my opinion is the worst. Meanwhile, Shihiro, on the other hand, is a realistic portrayal of a 10-year-old raised in a relatively wealthy family, which means he represents a lot of us when we were growing up. And the fact that the movie, the, and the fact that we see the movie through her eyes immediately brings us in, making us relate to her even as adults. Through the interactions between Shihiro and her parents, we get to realize the family is moving houses the reason behind Shihiro's distress. She expresses her emotions by sulking and showing reluctance to accept the changes that will ensue, as when she sticks her tongue out at the side of her new school. The parents, on the other hand, react to the antics of their daughter in an interesting way. While not being exactly dismissive, they do not empathize with Shihiro's feelings. It shows that there is a distance between childhood and adulthood and that adults don't always understand the emotions of a kid. Then the car Shihiro's father drives turns to the right towards the road in direction to Tochinoki residential development. I try to find out if this place is a real place since I-21 actually exists, it crosses Gifu Prefecture, but it's more likely that the place was simply inspired by sites in the area, since there is none in specific that seems to fit the imagery we are shown in the movie. 
To prepare for this review, I read a lot of positive and negative critics from the general public and I noticed that there are a lot of people who complain that the plot is paper thin. They think the movie needs to explain what are the spirits, where do they come from, why they are going to the bad house and all sorts of questions that are left open. But in reality, the movie doesn't have to explain these things because they have a root on Japanese religious beliefs, namely Shintoism. So it will be like watching a Christian movie and complaining that the movie doesn't explain where God comes from. You, the movie doesn't need to, it is implied in the Christian religion. In case you don't know what Shintoism is, Allow me to explain the belief in simple terms. Shintoism is a polytheistic and animistic religion that was born in Japan and that revolves around supernatural entities which are called Kami. The Kami are believed to live inside all things, which includes non-living things like fire, the wind or even famous places such as rivers, forests, even stones. Therefore, the spirits you see in Spirited Away are actually Kami. As for why the bad house, Shintoism states that all things are created pure. However, everything can be contaminated. Therefore, cleaning practices such as ritual watching and batting are very important. Accordingly, you can think of the bad house as both a place where spirits can rest and a place where they can purify themselves. At the very start of the movie, we, you can already see references to Shintoism. When Shiro's family gets lost, they come across a tori, a traditional Japanese gate, which is most commonly found at the entrance or inside Shinto shrines, where it symbolically marks the transition from the mundane to the sacred. Shiro also spots Okura, or Okura which are miniature Shinto shrines and can be found near a larger shrine or at streets on our street side. The way they appear in the movie is supposed to come off as unsettling because normally you don't see these shrines all put together next to each other. Since those shrines are supposed to house Kami, a house cluster of them indicates an area of high spiritual activity. Finally, there are statues, most likely those Josin. Although Shiro is scared of these statues due to its due to their ominous appearance, they represent those Jojin, which are the Shinto deities of roads and borders protectors of travelers, pilgrims, and those in transitional stages. I do not know why the statue that we see at the entrance of the tunnel has two faces. It is not uncommon for Dojozin to be represented as a human couple, but the one we see in the movie, it's not a couple. There are two faces, one on each side, and they are identical. I think, personally, I think it's foreshadowing to the existence of the, the twin witches, the Yubaba and Zeniba. When confronted with the tunnel, Shiro's dad wants to investigate and ignores the protests of Shiro. Since she is young, Shiro is more sensible to the spiritual, but can express herself, because talking about one's inner thoughts requires a maturity that she doesn't have. We'll see Shiro becoming more and more assertive as the movie goes on. As for the parents, they don't have any clue that something is wrong and they dismiss Shiro's fears because adults don't understand the fears of a kid. As they proceed, they are greeted by a vast sea of grass as soon as they step out in the open, a scenario that is cut here and there by more statues. These statues have some resemblance to Rakan statues. 
especially the one with the large ear. As for the theme park itself, it gets stranger and stranger the more you look at it. If you look at the clock on the clock tower, you will notice that not only it's in reverse, but it also has 13 hours instead of just 12. The empty buildings along the streets also have premonitory kanji. You can learn more about that if you go to the blog. Eventually, the parents pick up the scent of food, which guides them into a completely empty restaurant, whose counter is, however, stacked to the brim with fresh food. Upon seeing all that food, the parents don't hesitate to dive in, even though they might be aware that if the food was already there before they arrived, it was not prepared for them. When questioned by Shiro about this, the father says, don't worry, daddy has cash and credit cards, which shows how self-entitled he is, thinking that he can solve any problem that arises from their ill behavior with money. And Shiro, who has been trying so far to convince them to leave the park, gives up and leaves them to their gluttony. On this scene, Shiro takes her first step into independence. While wandering, Shiro comes across a bridge where she meets a strange boy, Aku, who tells her that she needs to leave before night comes, which leads to what is, in my opinion, one of the most gorgeous scenes in the movie. At the same time Aku is giving his warning, the sun is setting fast, and the shadows and colors that result from this sunset can almost be classified as unnerving. Then Shiro runs while the darkness falls upon the previous deserted city streets, with lanterns turning on as she goes, and their light reveals the spirit realm that was once, that was once occulted. The whole scene is, a com is accompanied by my favorite Spirited Away soundtrack, which is the Dragon Boy. Since Aku God just got introduced, I will bring forth the interesting symbolism surrounding his character. As we will find out later, Aku is a river spirit that takes the form of a dragon. In the Shintoism folklore, the dragon is a symbol of protection and loyalty, so it's very natural that he takes this supportive role on Shiro's journey. It is also possible that Aku might have been based on Mijuchi, a Japanese dragon which is first mentioned in the Nihon Shoki or chronic, the Chronicles of Japan. On this tale thought, Mijusi is a dangerous being that ends up being exterminated by a man named Agatamori, which is the ancestor of the Kazano Omi clan. Aku is also the embodiment of traditional Japanese cultural values. His attire is inspired by the Aeon period, being similar to a hakama. This speech is formal uses Watashi while referring to himself instead of Boku, and addresses Shihiro with the term Sonata, which is a noble and ancient way of addressing someone. An article which is called Sinto Perspectives in Miyazaki's anime film Spirited Away brings forward the theory that Miyazaki is trying to convey to contemporary viewers that the old traditions can be helpful in the modern world, which is represented in the movie by Aku helping Shiro on plentiful occasions. Likewise, Shiro's contribution to Aku's sense of identity might suggest that those living today can bring back the values that have been lost and forgotten. Upon discovering that her parents were turned into pigs as a punishment for their mindless consumerism, and that she can return to the human world, Shiro hides herself away and begins to disappear until Aku finds her and feeds her a berry of the spirit world. For those of you who are familiar with Greek mythology, or those who know the tale of Izanagi and Izanami, this scene might have caused a bit of anxiety, but in the world of Spirited Away, you don't get trapped forever if you partake in a meal with spirits, which doesn't mean that the act of eating in the movie is completely meaningless. 
When Shiro eats the berry that Aku gave her, it keeps her from vanishing. Later on in the movie, Aku comments that if Shiro keeps eating food from the spirit world, her human scent will be extinguished in three days. It is believed that with these scenes, Miyazaki wants to show that food ties people and cultures together. Therefore, while accepting the food given to her, Shiro is building an identity for herself in this foreign land. It is also important to notice that Shiro never eats for the sake of eating, rather out of necessity. First she does it because she needs to be anchored to the new world she's in. On a posterior occasion, we see her feeding on onigiri, which are rice balls, to regain her strength. The last time we see her eating is when Lin, which is a co-worker, offers her a steam bun filled with red bean paste. Although it is implied she shared the frugal meal with Zeniba, Yubaba's sister, close to the end of the movie. If you put Shiro's relationship with food next to the relationship that her parents have with food, the parallel is evident. It is a critique of the behavior of taking more than you need with no care for the consequences. And in this regard, food can be seen as a metaphor for a myriad of situations. While Aku and Shiru are running from Yubaba's gaze, they pass through several places. A brewery, a storehouse with gigantic food hanging from the ceiling, a freezer, a pig pen, and some more. This scene didn't have to exist, but because it does, we are now more connected to the world the film takes place in a subconscious level. These little glimpses to what is behind the curtains makes the spirit world believable. Very little is explained about this place, but you are able to use your imagination to fill in the gaps because you are provided with enough fuel to do so. In my years watching anime, I don't think I've seen someone do world building quite as Miyazaki does. This doesn't mean that other people do it wrong. It just means that Miyazaki has a very unique way of doing it. It has a feeling to it which people call Ghibli feeling, and I wish I could could explain this feeling, but it is impossible for me to fully grasp what it actually is or how it is received. Still, I will, I will still try to talk about some factors that I think might play a part or creating this at atmosphere. First of all, as we stated, Miyazaki's software building is marked by the absence of strict rules and by the addiction of elements that stimulate the imagination of the viewer. This works because, among other things, we get to see the same places from different angles, and because we are shown suggestions of structure. It also works because we are lavished by detail. When an action is happening, not only the principal characters are animated, but so are the background characters as well, with non-generic organic motion. There is also the existence of what Miyazaki himself describes as ma moments, or moments of silence. Sometimes the characters do things not because it is important for the plot, but because they are supposedly just people, and as people, they react to the environment around them. These three are, in my opinion, the most evident tools that Miyazaki uses in his storytelling. I hope you are enjoying the rev this review so far. I will be stopping here and saving the next topics for the next video in order to not make this way too long. I hope to see you next time.